played a very long time ago called Christ for Me, and uh, that was interesting, and, uh, but it was, a, uh, it was a tent revival song. It was a, it's just a chorus. It's very short, and it's, uh, yes, it's Christ for me, yes, it's Christ. Anyway, but uh, my mother played it, and that was, um, she had made that recording, oh my, a while back, and I don't know if you guys could hear clicking in it, well, <laughs> as if you knew my mother. She wore rings, but she also had fingernails. And so that recording was made on her piano at home. And so she took her iPhone and she sat it over next to the keyboard so it picked up every sound that her fingers made on the, on the keys. So that's kind of, it is cool. That's why it's there. So, and she had recorded that. She'd never posted it anywhere. She recorded it and sent it to me because that was one of, always one of my favorite songs of hers that she played. So, but anyway, so yes. Um, anyway, let's, let's go ahead and get started this morning. It's Christ for me. I love that song. Um, Genesis chapter 6. Genesis in chapter 6. Is this thing on? Yes, it's on. All right. <clears throat> the title of the message this morning is Jesus the Ark. Jesus the Ark. Text is going to be uh, Genesis chapter 6, verse number 8. The Bible says, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, I come before you this morning, Lord, and I, I thank you for this chance we have to be in your house. I thank you for those that are here. I pray you'll give each and every one of them a special blessing. Lord, we pray for those that, that watch the video later, and Lord, we just ask, Lord, that this message will be what you'd have it to be. We ask that the words will be yours and not mine. I pray that anybody that hears this message will, if there's a decision that needs to be made, they won't leave here without allowing themselves to make the correct decision for you. We ask for your guidance, we ask for your direction, and we'll give you all the glory for anything and everything you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. So here we see one of the most famous people in Scripture, Noah. So let's go back here a couple of more verses. And let's look at uh, uh, Genesis chapter 6. And we're going to see the story of Noah's Ark. Now we're not going to read the entire story. I would highly recommend reading chapter 6 and, uh, and reading chapter 7 and chapter 8. Those three chapters are a wonderful account of the time God destroyed the world. It's very interesting read. But we see here that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Go back and hear a couple of more verses to verse number five. The Bible says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. And it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. Both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air. For it repenteth me that I have made them. But then our text is beautiful. It says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So we look at the world as it was before the flood, 
And we can see that it's not much different than it is today. It's evil, it's wicked, it's nasty. And we were in Sunday school and we see how God is angry with the wicked every day. He does not like sin. The Bible also says that he will set no wicked thing before him. He can't stand evil, he can't stand sin. And we see here that not long after he had created mankind and um, Eve chose where we wanted to eat and uh, we ended up in trouble. What? Don't look at me like that. That's why anytime I ask you, where do you want to go to eat? You have to think about it. Well, the last time they picked, what happened? Anyway. <laughs> That's why I let my wife cook because, uh, anyway. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to eat for a while. <laughs> the world before the flood was pretty disgusting. It really was. We look there at verse number 5, and it says that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, I have to say that we're not completely there yet, but we're pretty close. How similar to today, though. Matthew chapter 24. Go over there real quick. The words of Jesus here. Matthew in chapter 24. I have to turn one more page. There we go. Matthew chapter 24, verse 38, the Bible says, For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So what can we learn from Noah? The world around him it was wicked. It was evil. It was disgusting. They were marrying and giving in marriage. In other words, they didn't care about the evil that surrounded them. They were going on as if life was absolutely normal. In another portion of Scripture, Jesus says that they were eating and drinking. They were just doing whatever they wanted. It was all about them. That's what we see today. We see that all around us. In today. And Jesus said, So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. So, what can we, as we are in a time that is similar to the days of Noah, what can we learn from him? Well, one of the things we can learn from him is that Noah preached. In uh, uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, I like to use scripture to back up when I say as often as I can. 2 Peter chapter 2, look at uh, verse number 5. The Bible says, And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person. Boy, it wasn't very long, was it? <clears throat> A preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. So we see that Noah was a preacher, and he preached righteousness. So what can we think about when it comes to the time before the flood? There was no law. There was no Torah. There was no Jesus. There was none of that. What was Noah preaching at the time before the flood? The Bible says he was preaching righteousness. So what is righteousness? Not sinning. That's all he could do. He could preach against sin. That's all Noah could do. Preach against sin and preach to turn to God. They were only a few generations removed from Adam himself. The man who walked with God in the Garden of Eden. They all knew the stories. They'd all heard about it. Not long before Noah, we had a guy named Enoch who preached. So it's not like they didn't have an excuse. Or it's not like they had an excuse. They had none. They had people warning them about the consequences of sin. And what did they choose to do? I can imagine Noah, as a preacher of righteousness, was a lot like some of the actual preachers we have today. 
preaching against sin, preaching about turning to God. And I can imagine that most of the reactions of the people around him were just about as nasty, if not more so probably, than they are today. You can see videos all over YouTube and on Facebook and different places of uh, street preachers. <laughs> they go out there with signs and says, you know, repent or perish or uh, turn to Jesus and all this. And they go out there and they, they preach the gospel. They try and uh, 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 witness to those walking back and forth. It's open air preaching is something that, that <clears throat> a lot of churches do. And uh, it's amazing to see the reactions of the people around them. How many times they've tried to be assaulted? How many times people try and steal their signs? How many times they, uh, they scream in their faces and hurl obscenities and spit at them and throw things at them? It is sad that we have gotten to such a point in society to where somebody doing something that just 30 years ago wouldn't have had a problem now they're attacked, they're reviled, they're spit upon, they're cursed at. Now, when we think of Noah, he had 75 to 100 years to build the ark. And do you really think that being a preacher of righteousness, the entire time that he was building that ark, when he would go to Home Depot or Lowe's to get his gopher wood and his pitch and mortar and slime and all that stuff, do you really think that he didn't tell those around him that he met what was coming? I believe he did. Can you imagine being Noah's neighbor? You look over there every day, and he's out there building this giant boat. And he's talking about the fact that God is going to send something that nobody has ever seen before. They've never seen rain. It was, the world was watered by dew. That was it. It was covered by a mist that would come up at, the, at night and would water the face of the earth. So Noah was out there talking about God's going to send a flood. He's going to send rain, and he's going to kill everybody. Can you imagine being them then? They thought he was insane. They would have thought he was an absolute lunatic. Now think about today, and we say Jesus is going to come back. What do they say about us? Lunatics. Y'all are nuts. They've been saying that forever. Y'all are crazy. What do you think they called Noah? Oh, it was pretty rough. I would imagine it was. He had three sons. Bet you they didn't have much fun in school. <laughs> oh, don't talk to them. That's the crazy kids. Their dad's nuts. He's building a boat. He says it's going to rain. Can you imagine that? How weird it must have been. How advanced were things back before the flood? Something that, uh, that I've always uh, thought interesting. If you go to Ecclesiastes, <clears throat> it's kind of a, an interesting thought. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, <clears throat> look here at verse number 9, the Bible says, the thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, See, this is new. It hath already been of old time which was before us. There is no remembrance of former things, neither shall there be any remembrance of things that are to come with those that, uh, that shall come after. Does, does that sound cryptic? It's a little cryptic. It's a little interesting, isn't it? Well, notice how it says, basically, there's nothing that is that hasn't been before, and there's nothing that will be that hasn't been now. So basically, how advanced was earth at the time of Noah? I would say it was pretty, probably pretty advanced. Did they have electricity? Well, the Bible says there is nothing that is that wasn't before, and there's no remembrance of the former things. 
I used to like to watch the History Channel. How many of you have ever seen the History Channel? You know, it used to actually have history on it. Now it's uh, pawn shops and something stupid. I don't know. It's, I don't watch it anymore. But the History Channel used to be fun. And so they used to have these archaeologists that would be looking at stuff in ancient Egypt, and they would be like, you know, uh, it looks like they used to have light bulbs in ancient Egypt. And everybody was like, them people are insane. They didn't have electricity back then. But then you look at the hieroglyphics on the walls and stuff, and they drew things that looked like light bulbs. And it's like, hmm, interesting. And so you hear all these uh, scientists and archaeologists and stuff say, we don't know how advanced Earth used to be. There's no record. There's no information about prior civilizations. And it's like, it's been in the Bible the entire time. So you can see Noah was on CNN because, you know, they had their reporter, uh, CNN, the communist news network. So they were out there with their camera and say, we're here at a local man's house, and he's still building a boat. Reports say that his family is preparing for rain. We, Tom, yeah, what is rain? Well, thank you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, we, uh, nearest we can figure is uh, rain is supposed to be water that comes out of the sky. And here at CNN, we do our best to be uh, objective. <laughs> sure they do. And uh, our top climatologist has said that that has not been something that has ever happened, and uh, we don't expect it to happen for this foreseeable future. Back to you, Bob. And Bob says, well, thank you. And uh, people from coast to coast are watching this on the news. This guy's nuts. This guy's nuts. Floods? Rain? The waters are going to be broken up? I mean, seriously? We're just one landmass. We've never been anything different. Wait a minute. What are you talking about, Brother Jake? You know how scientists talk about how all the continents used to be smooshed together into one big giant? Well, later in the flood story, it talks about how the fountains of the deep are broken up and the earth moves. Gee, what happened? The big continent was broken up. So you had CNN. No, let's not. It wasn't CNN. It was, uh, what can we call it? PNN. The Pagan. No. <laughs> Pangea News Network, right? From coast to coast, everybody was laughing at poor Noah. Everybody thought Noah was an absolute loon. They said, it's not going to happen. Noah's going to waste all this wood on a stupid boat, and nothing's going to change. Oh, there were. Oh, there were. You know, there, was, uh, there were the tree huggers out there saying, he's using all the wood. He's using too much mortar. It, 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 that's going to hurt the gophers. Well, I guess. Well, it was gopher wood. Yeah, exactly. Noah's not, well, Noah says it's going to rain. Well, why isn't the ark big enough for the Tyrannosaurus Rex? Who knows, right? We don't know what was going on. The Bible itself says there's nothing that is, that wasn't, that won't be, and we have no idea what it was like. He wasn't inclusive. He didn't have a handle on it. He did. Oh, you guys are nuts. <laughs> but we know Noah was a preacher of righteousness. We know he took every opportunity to warn that the end was coming. We know that he took every chance he could to tell people to turn away from their sin and turn to God and to get on the ark. Well, we know that it didn't work. And we know that only eight human beings entered that ark. So we go back to Genesis. <clears throat> and as we see later in chapter number six, he says that uh, he needs to take, you know, two of the, uh, every unclean animal and seven of every clean and all this, and he's got to load up the ark. So imagine before it, before it starts to rain, all the animals start coming, they all start loading up into the ark. 
and you know the news is out there watching like it's becoming a regular zoo here at the NOAA residence. We still don't know what to think about it, but uh, scientists say he's still crazy. Scientists think we're crazy too, don't they? Well, Jesus is coming. They're nuts. They're crazy. They're lunatics. So verse number five of chapter number seven. The Bible says, and Noah did according unto all that the Lord commanded him. And we see not long after that, that the rain starts. But see, then God does something. Look at verse number 16 in that very chapter, chapter number 7. And they went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded him. And the Lord shut him in. See, God ended that chance for people to turn away from their wickedness and to turn to him. And you know, I don't think Noah could have closed the door to the ark. Not because Noah was weak or not because he didn't have the ability, but... What do you do when the rain starts? You know, we, we see, the, I don't know if you've, anybody has Facebook, but, uh, you know, you see the meme, you know, fight like you're the third monkey trying to get on the ark, and brother, it's starting to rain. But you think about the humans, the people. Mm -hmm. They just spent 100 years, a gener however many generations, laughing at this fool, building a boat. Oh, it's going to rain. What is wrong with this guy? The news cameras are there. All the animals are finally up there. And Noah and his family have entered the ark. And they're like, well, they're going inside the ark. I guess we're going to see what happens now. And then they watch that door by itself close. I would wonder that too. And so Bob on PNN says, this just in, breaking news, the door to the ark closed. And then suddenly, it starts to rain. The Bible says that it was a great rain, that the, the fountains of the waters were broken up, that it was violent. When that first raindrop started to fall, you know, absolute panic broke out. Because all of those people, however millions and millions of people that lived on earth at that time, suddenly realized Noah was right. They suddenly realized that the God that they had ignored for all of their lives was real. And he was angry, and it was over. So when that rain started, you know that it was a mad rush to that ark. People were trampling one another. People were trampling children. They were running, pushing each other aside. No! Sorry, I didn't believe you. It's raining. Let me in. Let me in. You know that God had to close the door of that ark because what would Noah as a human want to do? He'd want to open that door and say, get in, get in. But God said, no. They made their choice. One of the saddest images of that flood has to be a mama with her baby running up the highest mountain she can find as the rain rises and the water rises and she stands up on the precipice of that mountain and she holds that baby up above the water. And it ends. Oh, no, I had to have had a heartbreaking experience. I honestly don't think he sat in there and said, well, serves him right. I guarantee you Noah was heartbroken. I guarantee you Noah wept hearing his friends and neighbors and probably his family that didn't listen. How quiet it must have been once the waters had covered everything and the end had settled. How quiet it must have been. It had to have been deafening and quiet. How many of you have ever been at home when the power goes out? Sucks, doesn't it? 
We get used to the random hum and whir and buzz and clicks and all these stupid noises that everything makes. But when the power goes out and it all shuts off, it's like, boom. Can you imagine that must have, what it must have been like for Noah? Granted, you know, you got the elephant snoring in the corner and <laughs> the lion not yawning over here. But Noah sitting alone in his little room. Who knows how many rooms and whatever were in that ark. It's got to be beautiful to go see the one that they recreated. But he's sitting there. And there's no more pounding on the sides. No more crying. There's no more screaming. There's nothing but the sound of water against the hull of that ship. Oh, poor Noah. It had to have been terrible. And just like, you know, people don't realize sometimes what the preacher's wife goes through. Imagine Noah's wife. She had to be there for him. She had to help him when he was, why didn't anybody listen to me? I tried. Why didn't they listen to me? Did I do something wrong? Maybe if I'd have tried harder. Maybe if I'd have preached louder. Maybe if I'd have grabbed him by the neck and thrown him in the ark. And she probably looked at him and said, you did everything you could, Noah. You did everything God wanted you to do. God ended their chance. Well, the title of the message, of course, is Jesus the Ark. Now go to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. See, just as Noah had to build an ark to save the righteous from the destruction of the world, God sent an ark for us to save us from the same exact thing. And that ark is Jesus. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13, the Bible says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way, that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Just like the door to the ark, no matter how big that door was, people ignored it. They chose destruction. They chose that which was comfortable to them, which was just the broad way, just to go the same way everybody else is going. Eight people walked onto that ark. Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their wives. That was it. How many people are going to find heaven? Oh, that's a rough thought, isn't it? That's a terrifying thought. Now, we look in Revelation, it talks about how so many, the, the she's of number of people that are saved that no man can number. And that's a wonderful thing that so many people will eventually find their way to heaven. But guess what? There's a lot more of them that won't. There's so many more of them that are going to be just like the people of Noah's day that are going to say, I don't believe that. I don't believe it all. And then the door is going to shut. Now, frankly, I think there's one way that we have it easier than Noah. Noah. Noah was there when those people died. Noah heard their screams. He heard their torment. We won't. When the end comes, we're going to be in heaven. We're going to be fine. We're going to be just great. But poor Noah. Now, if we put ourselves in his spot, we can think of our friends and our family that don't have Jesus. Jesus. And they're going to be like those people that were pounding on the door of the ark. Let me in, let me in, let me in. But there's not going to be an opening for them. They have to do it now. We have to get to them now. When we look at the end after Jesus comes and the, the nightmare on earth is going on and the tribulation and all those things, it's going to be brutal. It's going to be billions of people die. Salvation is going to end up with the lost head. It's going to be ugly stuff. And I have a question for you. If people don't want to accept Jesus now, 
Will they even be willing to do it then? The Bible says how many, how many wicked men will say they will curse God because of the punishments that come upon them. So Jesus said, as in the days of Noah were, how many people, of course there were those that said, oh man, Noah was right, let me in, let me in. But also how many of them were there sitting in their house as the rain was falling, the water starts rising, and they were cursing God. The Bible says in Revelation, later in Revelation, that that happens, that they curse God and refuse to repent of their deeds because of the plagues. So how many people, when the rain started to fall and the flood waters started to rise, were shaking their fists into the sky saying, Curse you, God! How dare you! A lot of them. Only evil continually. Now what happens today? People get mad at God for everything. Are they going to be any different then? It's really hard to say. Now is the easy time to accept Jesus Christ. Now is the, the best time to turn around and get on the ark because once the door is shut, that's it. That's it. Revelation chapter 20. <clears throat> Revelation in chapter 20. I'm going to read just a couple of verses here, and then we're going to go back a couple of books. Revelation chapter 20, verses 14 and 15, the Bible says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Oh, what a terrible time that will be! For no excuse will be accepted by the judge as he sits on that great white throne. Because when they say, well, I didn't know. All he's got to do is say, but this, he'll show them. Is God just? Is God fair? When they say, because Jesus talks about how they'll say, but Lord, didn't I do this in your name? But Lord, didn't I do this in your name? And he's going to say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, for I never knew you. Just like those people that couldn't get on the ark even if they tried after the rain started. There's going to be those that stand before the great white throne. I doubt they're going to stand. They're probably going to be on their faces, bawling, begging, pleading. And he's going to say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. And they're going to say, but, 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 I didn't know. And he's going to say, but what about when my child, Liz, invited you to church? When my sister, when my bro or when my son Johnny tried to give you a track and you took it and you, you took it to make him feel better, but then you threw it away. I gave you chance after chance to see the truth and you rejected my son. Depart from me into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Can you imagine that? Oh, how terrible that would be. Last week, we pre I preached about hell. And what a terrible place that's going to be. But can you imagine choosing to ignore Jesus, choosing to ignore God, and then standing before Him and having to be told, depart from me. What a terrible time that must be. The only close example of that we can think of would be when the door of the ark closed. See, Jesus is our ark. All we have to do is follow him. And we escape that terrible time. We escape that terrible destruction. But how many people don't want to get on the ark? How many people don't want to believe it? So God shut the door of the ark. And he's going to shut the door to heaven. Second Thessalonians. And then we'll be done. Second Thessalonians. <clears throat> One of these days I'm going to preach a, a series of messages on the second coming. And we can get into all those things that happen after the rapture. And the importance of them. And I think that's an important thing that needs to be preached in today's world. 
But let's look at this one thing here. I think this is probably one of the least popular <laughs> portions of Scripture, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 11. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned, who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. See, this is after Jesus comes. And regardless of what the, the left behind movies and all that stuff says, there are those that have heard the gospel, that have been given the opportunity to be saved. There are those that were raised in church. There's been those that have known about this for decades. When Jesus comes back and they've rejected him enough times, they've rejected him even once. The Bible says that God will send them strong delusion that they might believe a lie. What lie are they going to believe? They're going to believe the Antichrist. And it says that they might be damned. Those people that had an opportunity to get saved, that had a genuine encounter and almost accepted Christ, but chose to say, no, nah, I don't want nothing to do with him. Guess what? They're doomed. They're done. It's over. God's going to shut the door of the ark. He's going to shut the door of heaven. And they're doomed. How many people do we know like that? How many? We know lots, don't we? We know people that we work with. We know people in our family. We know people that are our friends that have rejected Jesus Christ. And when Jesus comes back, their time is up. That's something we need to remember. That should make us even more emphatic. It should make us more eager to witness to our friends and our family and those that we know have rejected Jesus because we can show them that and they can say, what? Because how many people have actually seen those verses in Scripture? Not very many because nobody wants to talk about it. It's unpopular to say that God's going to cut off, that there's going to be no last chance, that there's not going to be a second chance. That doesn't make God sound very nice. Too bad. It's the truth. Amen. And the truth will make you free. But you have to accept it. Every head bowed, every eye closed. We're going to have a time of invitation now. Are you on the ark? If you aren't on the ark this morning, whether you're watching on video or you're here this morning, come get on the ark this morning. Come accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. Be on that ark, for when that door closes, the time is over. Maybe you know somebody that you need to witness to. Maybe you, you have friends and family that, that need to be reached, and you've thought about them this morning. Come bring them to the altar this morning. Pray for them, and maybe you might not be the one to lead them, but somebody will be. God will give them the opportunity. Our Father and our God, I come before you this morning, Lord, and I thank you for this chance we have in your house. And I pray that this time of invitation, that the, the Holy Spirit will be free to do as He pleases, and Lord, help us be willing and open to do what He wants us to do. Pray you bind the devil from, this, from us this morning, Lord, that we might make the right decisions, and that will give you all the glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. As music begins to play, the altar's open.
Amen. in mercy at the proper time mm -hmm. to shut that door. But I'm thinking how many people were so close to, you know, we know that that hour is going to come and people are convicted, but they haven't, they just haven't, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, and they, they would, they, they're right there on the edge, just, right like, there. just like King Agrippa, where he yeah. looks at Paul and he says, yeah. almost, almost persuaded me almost. to be a Christian. That is one of that's so sad, yeah, yeah. so tragic, because that king was right there, and the Holy Spirit grabbed his heart, and he's like, almost, Paul, almost, because he knew the law, he knew the scriptures, he knew about it all, and he just almost. See, that's where the flesh kicks in, huh? Yep. Oh, man. Because yeah. God, God had mercy. mercy. Oh, yeah, he, he waited mercy. till that last he moment. Mercy. He waited till that last moment, and Noah said, there, man, they're not going to listen, they're not going to listen. Or I think it was that passage is for God is patient. Slow to anger, for he wants mm -hmm. all to come to know the truth. Right. Our gracious God is so. He, he is. He is. He hasn't come, but we see. What's he waiting on? <laughs> he's waiting. <laughs> because he's time. like, come on, come on. He's just, he's just waiting. Mm -hmm. Stop on her. The other mm -hmm. word that, uh, that I kind of stumbled on, and, and we, we just, we miss it, trust me, because we're reading the word. We're, we're reading the word of God. Mm -hmm. But you know, what really made the difference during that judgment time for every imagination? Yeah, you know, only come on. People. Man has gotten, you know, we go to Hollywood and you see the imagination of man. Yes. Talk about, you know, because we just know he's wicked. But when you apply imagination, every imagination, he goes into so much garbage. He's capable of that. Yep. He is, he, man, yep. human beings, we're capable of that. Well, you the devil. Well, it's not the devil's fault. No, honestly, if you really look at it, who is the most evil person? Who's the most evil creature in God's creation? We are. Yep. Because, I mean, what, what did Satan do? All Satan did was say, well, I can do better than God. And then all he did was convince Eve, oh, you can be better than God. That yeah, was it. The devil's the guy who puts the candy on the table. He puts a piece of candy on the, on the <laughs> table and he starts us on that stupid path. And walks and away. And he's like, don't exactly. touch that. Exactly. Right. <laughs> our human flesh that says, oh, well, I have exactly. to. I have to. Exactly. And like it says there in Genesis, was only evil continually. When you were not. With what you named it, I thought you were going to go with Matthew 7 7. What? Well, just the heart. Well, yeah. Not the you even, right when you went to Matthew, oh. you even said he shuts the door, and then I was like, he's going to use Matthew 7, 7. <laughs> and then he went somewhere else, and I'm like, oh, behold, they stand at the door and knock. <laughs> Say, hey, the world 